Welcome to Why I Left, a podcast that explores the great resignation. I'm your host, Brian Akar. Join me as I chronicle real stories from real people about the reasons they decided to leave their jobs during the pandemic and what has happened since. Hello, and thanks for tuning into this episode of Why I Left. In today's episode, I chat with Kristen Weisdack. Kristen is the founder and CEO of Behavior Works of Southwestern Pennsylvania. Over the last 17 years, she has worked in the mental health field specializing in autism and behavior intervention. Kristen's professional experience has helped her understand that the causes of behavior are often rooted in nutrition, allergies, undetected vision issues, and problems that occur early on in life. Let's go check it out. All right, welcome back. So our guest today is Kristen Weisdack. Kristen's company, Behavior Works, works with parents, mental and behavioral health professionals, occupational and physical therapists, along with speech language pathologists, and nutritionists and teachers to shift their practice to a holistic approach. Oftentimes, those who are involved with individuals with autism, ADHD, and behavioral issues are frustrated and overwhelmed with navigating the behavior that ensues. So her team conducts training where people learn practical, evidence-based strategies to help address the root cause of a student or client's behavior. Now, during this Mental Health Awareness Month, I wanted to bring her perspective to the show to shine a light on these strategies. So hi, Kristen. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Brian. I really appreciate being here and uh, just just spreading more of our message to more people so that we can we can really improve the lives of those that are in that mental health and the behavioral health system. So thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. And now before we get into some of your work, tell us a little bit about your background and upbringing. Yeah. So as far as my education goes, I have my undergraduate degree in uh, human development and family studies. My master's degree is in applied behavior analysis with a certification in autism. And I'm currently pursuing my doctoral degree in learning and organizational change at Baylor University. A lot of what I've learned over the years has been really through my son and some of the personal experiences I have being a, a woman with Asperger's syndrome. And so it's really been a personal and, and a professional endeavor having children that have needed you know, more intervention with sensory and vision issues. Yeah, my education has come both personally and professionally. So it's been really a paradigm shift in the way that I view behavior. Oh, very nice. And and what have been what have you been passionate about professionally? Really educating more professionals and behavioral health providers and mental health providers, because what I see happening in both the school systems and the mental and behavioral health arenas is that so many professionals are getting burnt out and overwhelmed with navigating these issues. There's just so many more kids coming through those systems with autism, ADHD, behavioral concerns, and people that don't have a background in behaviorism, or that's their first child or client that they've worked with with autism. It can be really, really overwhelming. And seeing the the attrition rates that are happening across the board in those fields. I'm really passionate about sharing simply what questions other professionals can be asking to address the root cause of those children's deficits. Because it's not necessarily that, you know, that child will never be able to learn or a lot of people underestimate those folks. And so we're really passionate about sharing when you're able to take a bigger look at behavior, you start to understand that it's not that that person, that individual, that child, it's not that they won't respond appropriately, it's they can't because there's underlying biological and physiological issues that we can work to uncover if we just know what questions to ask. So we're really passionate about spreading that message to other providers. Well, that's great. And tell us a little bit about your your work journey and how you got involved in the mental health field. So um, (laughs) it wasn't a straightforward approach. Uh, I was working for a utility company uh, in my very early 20s. And I had always known 
in the fourth grade, <laughs> I had an experience where the teacher asked us if we wanted to go next door to work with the children with special needs for our recess period, or if we wanted to go outside and play with the other kids in our grade. And I chose to go next door. And really from such an early age, it really helped shape my passion and knowing that that's the people that I wanted to be working with, knowing that taking the time to be patient and caring and just the simplest interactions bring joy. When those people felt seen and recognized and understood and just treated as human, just treated fairly, what difference it makes in their lives. And so from that early age, I knew that I wanted to work with individuals with special needs. So I was working for a utility company in my early 20s. And one of my colleagues got a job at the local intermediate unit. And I really wasn't sure what that was. And it turns out that she was working as a paraprofessional in the school system. And I inquired and got hired uh, working for the intermediate unit as a paraprofessional. So the, for those listening that don't know what that is, you're basically a teacher's aide that goes into the classroom and works with children with special needs. And so you're one-on-one -on -one for educational support, for emotional support, for redirection, encouragement, et cetera, et cetera. And I just fell in love with it, Brian, honestly. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever done, but I learned very quickly what not to do. <laughs> and I had really strong mentors that I was working with at that time, which was really, really an incredible difference in my professional trajectory. And from working as a paraprofessional, one of the teachers that I was working with that was substituting in our room at one point, she was what's called a TSS. So at that time, it was a therapeutic staff support. And so I got another job, a second job, working in homes with children with special needs. And now these were more the school age kids, but also some adolescents and providing that same support just in a different setting. And then from there, I really wanted to pursue and finish my undergraduate degree and my master's degree. And after I finished my master's degree, I started working with adults with special needs and really having that diverse range of uh, experience. <laughs> I then was offered a job in early intervention. And so that's really been my home, my therapeutic home, I'll say for the last seven years is working with the zero to three population um, but also training adults. Uh, I just absolutely love it. But having that, like I said earlier, that experience with my son and him being born early really helped shape a holistic view. And so that's what we do now is really work with folks to understand how behavior is so much more than meets the eye. No, definitely. And you talk about that, that early intervention. And so now you eventually lead to specializing in autism and in this behavior intervention. So what, what led to that and those specializations? I, I honestly think, I think, Brian, we have these serendipitous moments in our lives that really shape who we're to become. And my first placement working for that intermediate unit was in a, an autistic support classroom. And I always was inquisitive about wanting to know why, why, why these kids were operating like they were. You know, why couldn't they respond to commands and why did they have these social skills deficits? Why weren't they talking? And so I think it was just my natural inquisition. I just really wanted to learn more about what was going on with those kids. But it was based on that initial placement in that classroom. And I was just fascinated by it. No, oh, that's, that's great to hear. And, and now I want to take you back a little bit. Let's go back to March of, of 2020 to when we'll talk a little bit about, about COVID, right? And so we're introduced to the pandemic as, as we know it now. Um, because I think it, there's a nice correlation with some of the things that we're also experiencing when it comes to child's behavior. So now tell us a little bit about how the pandemic affected you and potentially your practice. So. I really started taking my practice seriously in January of 2020, and that meant going into physical spaces and working with more teachers, working with more parents to have these trainings, right, to talk about these holistic approaches. And then, as you said, March 2020 comes around, the COVID hits, and in person, I'm having these dynamic, engaging trainings and now it's a matter of how do I very quickly shift to an online platform, platform to survive? But on top of that, how do I continue to make it just as engaging and immersive if I'm not face-to-face -face with people? 
because I love having that natural conversational flow with people. You know, there was a concern about getting different generations to adapt to that online learning environment and learning about the Zoom platform. And so it was a matter of really survival mode when it came to March 2020. And how do I how do I make that shift for myself to be able to survive? And now when you think about your your clients, right? So how did the pandemic start to affect some of your clients and your industry as a whole? Well, right. That's that's a great point because that's a great question because when COVID hit in early intervention, all face-to-face interactions stopped. And again, it was a problem because many, many families have multiple children in their home. So they weren't able to be online. They weren't able to even receive tele-intervention services. Or maybe they lived in an area that didn't have good Wi-Fi. And so they weren't able to have those services at all. So now you have children that were not receiving services, that were still having behavioral issues in the home setting. And a lot of the my colleagues were trying to offer those tele-intervention services, but a lot of that was falling short. So I believe it was probably about 10 to 12 months really after the pandemic hit that we were able to start going back into homes. But it was based on the number of cases and if it was like that red, orange, or green level of COVID cases. And even then, we had to wear gloves and masks going into these homes And it was very disheartening to see because when you're trying to work on speech with a child and you have a mask on or you suddenly appear differently to them because kids with autism love routines. And when now you're showing up in their household and you have these funny gloves on that feel weird to them and you have this face mask that they can't see really who you are, it really threw off a lot of what our efficiency and our effectiveness as providers. In terms of trainings, I think it took a while for people to make that shift to the online platform because people, I mean, that's the first time. I mean, Zoom really wasn't highly used, at least in our profession. And I think a lot of people can can speak to that. And so it took a while for those late adopters, I'll say, in early intervention, to really come on board with using that that Zoom platform. And so there was a lot of different things that it just took a while to make that shift. But one other thing that has affected these kids that I'm working with as far as COVID, I'm noticing that once the child or the family has had COVID, the children in the household that we work with are more likely to have sensory sensitivities. So now we were trying to understand how COVID, the virus, actually affects the behavioral aspect of the child at the biological, at the physiological level, and just seeing what research informs that and how we can make the referrals to the right people to help those families work that out. So there's a lot of, a lot of different things that happened when COVID hit, but we really had to make a lot of adaptations to survive. Now that's very interesting, right? And, and you know, so we talk about, because look, the pandemic had had an effect on children's behavior overall, right? And I know you're kind of in the zero to three space, but when you think about kind of what you noticed just in the industry as a whole, what were some of the things that you, you know, your, that were uh, discussed in, in your, your circles around, you know, what is happening with children's behavior specifically during this time with remote learning, all the things? Well, I'd like to speak to that as a parent as well, honestly, Brian, because I have two children of my own. Oh, yeah. My son was in preschool, and so we were just home. (laughs) We were one big happy family, (laughs) um, but my daughter's online learning experience really suffered because having that disconnect from your friends and that social experience, being able to be in person and learning from someone, people need to be able to experience learning sometimes in an embodied way. Embodied learning is just all about how can I move my body to really enrich the experience and how can it really be cemented in my body? And so with that disconnect that occurred, a lot of those kids, and especially this relates to what we were doing in early intervention, if we're not there to model it in person, like a camera and a phone is an inanimate object to them. They, they don't care, right? The kids that we're working with with developmental delays. But there's really such a big disconnect that occurred. And... 
I'm just worried that there are so many social skills that have been lost during that pandemic. And not just like I said, for that early intervention, all kids that were in that that education space, you know, we're really seeing more of a, a gap in math, a big gap in math, but not so much in reading because you use you read every day, right? You're reading text messages, no matter really how old you are now, you're reading books. But math is not something that you really use and apply. I know some people that are that are big into math are going to um, scoff at this, but really m- my t- my 11 year old isn't converting fractions on a regular basis, we'll say. And so there's just so many deficits in education and social and emotional skills that we're seeing across the board with everybody. I agree. And look, I, I parent of two as well. And that remote learning experience was, was not enjoyable, right? And my, my were, well, they're seven and four now, but they were, you know, five and, and three at the time. And it, it, it was a struggle to have, to have a preschooler on remote learning. It was truthfully almost like a waste of time for us because what, you know, their attention spans were, were, were less than the 10, <laughs> less than 10 seconds. And, and it, it, it was a struggle. So I'm glad, glad that you, you mentioned that. And so now as you've kind of gone through some of these things, what were, what were some of the learnings that you picked up? now going through the pandemic? I mean, going through the pandemic has really taught me resilience, how to really challenge myself to think differently about obstacles, whether that be as a a mom, as an entrepreneur. It really gave us space and time as a family, which I really loved. But from a professional note, um, that's when I started my doctoral program. So that added a little bit of... uh, uh, dynamics to my to my life as well, but it really adds an element of dealing with obstacles better and understanding that because for me it's it's it felt like I was living in this different world during the pandemic because it was just so much different than what you would expect. But when I felt empowered, not just and resilient, not just as a professional, but I felt empowered to find resources for my family to keep them healthy too. So there was a lot of different dynamic changes that we had to adopt to, but it was a matter of, in the beginning, I kind of felt victimized in not having the resources I needed to keep my family healthy. And so it was a matter of really having this this paradigm shift for myself, both personally and professionally, of what can I do to help me and my family get through this a lot better. No, that that's great to hear, and I would love to now maybe shift a little bit to talk a little bit about your your practice, All right? So tell us about Behavior Works and the focus of your company. Well, right now we have been focusing on working with educators, mental health, and behavioral health providers. So we have worked in about twenty two counties so far across the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, we're also working with some school districts, uh, some daycares. We're working with some organizations that work with adults as well. And we have started working with foster and adoptive agencies, really targeting the organizations that are most deeply affected by this. Because the other thing that's happening, as I talked about kind of this attrition in the mental health space, the supports that those organizations once had are not there right now because of the great resignation and everything that's happening with people, people are leaving, right? This is, this is what we're talking about right now. What ends up happening is because those folks don't have the proper support, they're floundering, they're getting burnt out. And so that's when we can really work with those organizations, those daycares to say, what are some practical evidence-based strategies that you can instill in your classroom right now that not just help the kids with special needs, but all the kids? So how can we incorporate dynamic movement play and sensory-based play to really, again, address the root cause, but really shifting the focus and hopefully the empowerment that those providers now feel that they can ask different questions than what they were asking before. So now that after our trainings, they feel empowered and they understand the power of asking, was that child born via C-section? Or were they born vaginally? You know, what are their eating habits? Do you think that their eyes are working together? We talked a little bit about what's called ocular motor dysfunction in our trainings. 
And so it's really equipping those providers with the skills that the folks that once were there had. And so really getting them to be more uh, resilient in what they're doing, but to help them reconnect with the passion that they have for working with those kids. They really want to see those kids succeed, but they can't really do that without those tools. And so that's what we're really working on focusing. Uh, that's what we're really focused on right, right now is working with those agencies throughout Pennsylvania. Oh, that's great to hear. And, and now for background for, for our listeners uh, from an autism standpoint. So what, what is autism and what causes it? So there's a great debate about what causes autism. There's this idea of epigenetics, that there's genetics and then there's environmental things that happen that basically turn your genetics on to express certain things like social emotional problems and language skills, behavioral issues. So really the the big idea around it is epigenetics, that you're born a certain way with certain genetics and something comes along and flips that switch. Right now in the US, there's about one in 44 kids that's affected with autism. And it's really different for everybody that has an autism diagnosis. Some of the common characteristics, now this is always, always guided by a psychologist that diagnoses these things through what's called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, 5th edition. But they really look at, you know, is that child lining things up? Are they spinning in circles? Is, are there repetitive behaviors, restricted interests? We call them self-stimulatory behaviors. So you might see some rocking, you might see some flapping of the hands, wanting to watch things fall. It can be toe walking as well, because a lot of those kids are in fight or flight. But then you have, so there's in autism, there's level one, two, and three. So when you have level three, those are the individuals that are most severely impacted that need the most support. And then two is, is medium supports and then one is minimal supports. And so it's a matter of when you see an individual with autism, it could be just somebody with social skills deficits. Like for me, I struggle in social situations sometimes with attentional issues. I have a deep love of learning about autism, <laughs> funny enough. And so it presents itself differently in everyone you meet with autism. So it's not just, this is what I expect when you look at someone. It's not that Dustin Hoffman, right? <laughs> that Rain Man approach. Right, it's, right. it's, we really need to think about how it presents differently in different people. No, definitely. And are there, are there like, you mentioned, uh, you know, the lining things up, uh, to walking things like that. Are those the types of signs that, you know, people and parents should be aware of? Yes. And they should always be having a conversation with their pediatricians and trust your intuition. Even if you have gone, cause we've talked to it and I've worked with many, many families over the years, trust your intuition. If your pediatrician says something you don't agree with, get a second opinion, trust your gut, I can't say that. I can't stress that enough, Brian, because so many families have come to me and said, you know, I'm really concerned because, you know, he's a year and a half or even two year olds that we work with an early intervention that aren't talking or kids that aren't walking until they're almost a year and a half, two years old. And so one thing that you can look at a great resource for families, um, the Center for Disease Control actually has an app called the Milestones app. So parents can download that Milestones app. It's completely free. And it goes over what milestones your child should be meeting and when to call early intervention for assistance. Now, here in the state of Pennsylvania, early, inter early intervention is completely free. So parents don't have to worry about, about paying for those services out of pocket. And you have everybody that comes to you. So whether that is um, in a home setting, in a daycare setting, they're able to come to you. But that Milestones app can really help families understand from a developmental perspective of walking, social emotional skills, talking. It runs through the whole gamut of self-help skills. But when you start to notice something that's different, especially when you have more than one child and you start to compare, right? We try not to compare as, as parents, but you do start to notice those differences and your intuition kicks in. Check that Milestones app, have that conversation with your pediatrician. And even if they say, wait, I never recommend to wait. Call your local early intervention agency and have somebody come out and just assess, right? Generally here in PA, what happens is there's a team of folks that will come out that will maybe consist of a special instructor 
or an OT or a PT, a physical therapist. And that group can really talk you through some of the concerns that you're seeing and really make a great understanding of what they can do through early intervention to help your child succeed. Very nice. That, that's really good to know. And I'll be I'll make sure I share that information in, in the show notes as well, because I think that'll be helpful. You now, one of the things I noticed in your practice, you know, you have this this holistic approach, right? And so talk a little bit about that approach to behavior intervention in children and adults and the training that you and your team lead. Well, right. And a lot of that, honestly, Brian, was because of my son being born early. It really started because he was born at 33 weeks and two days. And he was in the NICU for about 54 days. And he needed occupational therapy for feeding services in the NICU. And then when we got home, he had them for about three or four months as well. Everything that I was doing to help him wasn't enough as a behaviorist specializing in autism because he was born with a submucosal cleft palate. And what that just basically means is that the skin of the roof of his mouth was there, but the bony part wasn't. And so we weren't sure about his talking and his development. So we started using some sign language with him. So I had to learn as I went, but working in early intervention already and working with dynamic teams, I really started to understand other people's approaches and understanding how nutrition plays a big role For instance, if you have a child that has reflux or ear infection, so this is this is when we start talking in our trainings about what questions to ask. If we know that a child has chronic ear infections or reflux, we think in the back of our minds or we can start to think about uh, cow's milk allergy because there's tons and tons of research on PubMed and we always equip our families with the right resources and the research to back it up to help them advocate. But we think about what allergies are already happening with that child to make them have that reflux. But when you start to understand if that's a kiddo that has reflux and they're in that critical stage of crawling as development, crawling is so important because you're organizing the left and right parts of your body. But that also creates a roadmap, a neural network and the connectivity of both hemispheres of your brain. They say rigid spine, rigid mind. But if you've developed this motoric fluidity and you can move, you're not only developing great roadmaps, basically the connections between your hemispheres, you're working on binocular vision, you're working on hand-eye coordination, and you're developing the musculature in your hand. It's called your thenar eminence and your hyperthenar eminence, which you need later in life for smooth writing. So now you might be a messy handwriter because you had reflux as a kid and didn't crawl smoothly. So if we can really affect change at an early age, that zero to three window, but we work with providers that serve adults as well. If we can really understand just what questions to ask and who to refer those folks to, it can be life-changing because of the fact that neuroplasticity exists and you can work really work around some of those damaged neural areas. But so that's our focus right now It's just training those individuals what questions to ask, who you can refer those families to. But in the meantime, what are some practical evidence-based strategies you can be doing in a classroom, in a daycare setting, in your home setting to help your child succeed? No, I love that. And that, you know, this this is crucial information to know, right? And so I I think the work that you all are doing, you know, I, I just I just commend that because those times I and I remember, God, it feels like feels like so long ago, right? But checking the the milestones <laughs> for my little guys was just just making sure we were on top of it, right? And so, but that is so, mm-hmm. so crucial to that. And I did not did not really recognize or even truthfully think about the whole what crawling meant from a left side, right side of the brain aspect, right? So I find that that is fascinating. I'm going, to, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole on that one a little bit later. Um, <laughs> and now, one of, one of the things I wanted to to ask a little bit about as it pertains to to autism was, you know, you often hear about those with autism experiencing, you know, meltdowns, if you will, right? And I know you talk, you have seen you talk a few, a little bit about, you know, a couple tips, right? So, what are like five tips that you can share to help reduce? those types of occurrences for either parents or or guardians or family members who have others or may have experienced someone uh, who may be having a meltdown uh, from an autism standpoint? I would really say from if you're the if you're the parent or you're the professional, you need to be calm first and foremost. 
So for yourself, that might mean deep breathing. We talk about cold water exposure, whether that's splashing cold water on your face, doing little tricks like rubbing your ears, because that activates something called your vagus nerve. And your vagus nerve is your 10th cranial nerve, and it helps you switch from fight or flight to rest and digest. And it takes like a minute to do. The reason you want to do those things before you are going to jump in when your child or the adolescent child that you're working with or the client is frustrated is because of this idea of co-regulation. All of our bodies are made up of cells that vibrate at different frequencies. If we can decrease the frequency of that vibration before we go into that setting, that person will match our vibrational frequency and it also helps them calm down faster. So if you can first recognize your heightened state of awareness, do what you need to calm yourself and then intervene, that's a really great tip. So using the cold water, the deep breathing, rubbing of the ears, um, and there's all kinds of evidence around how the, the um, vagus nerve innervates parts of the ear and people can look, up, look that information up online. The other part I would say is knowing how to be proactive versus reactive for a meltdown. So for instance, I was working in a home with a kiddo the other day and it was past the time that he was supposed to eat breakfast because mom and I were chatting about his progress from the previous couple of weeks we were working together and she happened to miss that. And so he really starts having this tantrum where he starts banging his head on the floor. He's really fussing, he's crying. He's having a really difficult time and mom starts really just talking to him in full sentences. The thing to recognize is that if you're going to be reactive, when a person is flustered like that, especially a young child, they can't express themselves. Generally, they're already in that fight or flight mode in their brain. When a person is in their fight or flight area of their brain, it's right here. That's the reptilian brain that's hundreds of thousands of years old. That part of the brain is responsible for just keeping you alive. So things like breathing and heart rate, you're not able to, it's not you won't, it's you can't, think and reason and understand. So when you're already in that situation, in the thick of it with this, this child or the adolescent or whoever you're working with, speak in very simple terms. So what I had the mom do, I said, kind of notice how much conversation is going on right now. And I had already talked to her about fight or flight and rest and digest. And she said, oh, okay, I get it. So she said, bib on, then eat. And he just was like, oh, okay. And she was really caught off guard that that worked so well. But having a conversation with somebody that's living in a part of their brain where they can't reason and think is not effective. And so just understanding that difference between fight or flight and rest and digest. On the end of that, if you're going to try to be proactive for the next day, right, Knowing that the kids say wakes up by 830 every day. And if I don't feed them by 930, we're going to have hangry, right? Everybody has experienced hangry as a parent or you've experienced hangry as yourself. It's that hunger and anger that happens. When you notice that patterns start to happen because you're already collecting some data around that, maybe just mentally or maybe on paper too, time when you're going to give them a snack by setting a reminder on your phone. So if you know that behavior starts to happen at 9.30, digestion takes about 20 minutes. So you'd set a timer for like 9 o'clock or 9.10 to get them a snack. And always keeping snacks in your purse, in the car, whatever you carry with you. So you can continue to make sure that they don't have that hangry phase. Because your body elicits this hormone that, that controls hunger and anger at the same time. And a hangry isn't actually an actual physiological problem your body's experiencing because it creates this anger to motivate you to go out and seek food. And so when that happens, um, it's just not a pretty picture. So I would say having those tools as a parent to understand when you yourself are going into that fight or flight and how to co-regulate with your child, but then also knowing how to be proactive and reactive once you're already in that situation. That is you know, who knew, I had no idea that, that hangry was an actual, like it's an actual thing. It's not just something, some word that someone made up, you know? So that is awesome to know. Okay. That see, and now that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, as I'm now kind of scrolling through, 
you know, some of my experiences with my own two kids and sometimes, sometimes myself, but that makes perfect sense. Uh, but and you're right. That timing yeah. piece is important, especially uh, as it pertains to like having that routine, you know, and now one right. thing I wanted to, to have you talk about a little bit too, is, you know, I checked out your YouTube channel and, you know, what, by the way, I love the content that you're sharing there. I've, I've not only learned well, a lot in you. this discussion, but I've, you know, watched a few of, of your videos and, and it's just good information that you're sharing. So you host the channel Beyond Behavior. Now tell our audience, you know, about the kinds of information that you share there. So it's really, again, about that holistic approach. We have, because we serve a wide variety of folks, we wanted to really interview parents that have been there, done that with their children, that have already been having that in, intuition to say something is going on with my child and have their pediatrician not listen and kind of the journey that they've been through so that other parents can resonate with that and feel empowered to advocate for their own child. So we've interviewed parents, we've interviewed professionals, we've interviewed one of the vice chiefs of staff at two of the local hospitals. She's an osteopathic doctor, Dr. Michelle Thompson. She's absolutely incredible, but she really leads other physician trainings and helping them understand food as medicine and how they can help their patients be more proactive rather than reactive. How can we be preventative around disease and create these really holistic experiences for our, our clients, our, our patients that we're working with? So she really talks about sound therapy and understanding all kinds of different modalities that are out there for patients to give them some autonomy and caring for themselves. But you really can't do that until you know what's out there. So in addition to the parents and Dr. Thompson, We've also interviewed uh, developmental optometrist, Dr. Hans Lessman, and that's one of the things that people don't commonly know about is the difference between an optometrist and a developmental optometrist. So I really wanted to interview him to talk about how kids with autism and ADHD are 40% more likely to have um, ocular motor dysfunction. And so that just means their eyes aren't working together. And that's something that a, a general optometrist and a nurse simply isn't trained to look for. And so it's a matter of how can you either look at a child's baby pictures or how can you do a quick assessment of, of looking at to see if those that child's eyes are working together. So in our trainings, we just have people look at like the smooth pursuits. How can you assess if there's any jump in the eyes as they move back and forth and they can they converge when they look at something near. We just really wanted to have also some nutrition on there as well and understanding the role that nutrition plays. Like I talked about the reflux, gluten-free, dairy-free cooking is a lot of my kids and myself personally, we have to be gluten-free, dairy-free in my house. And that's not an easy feat. So we've talked about, and we've created our own content, but we've talked to one of the local ladies here in, in the PA area, she is uh, Sandy Kern. She actually has an incredible book that's available on Amazon. It's called Desire to Be Well. And it's not just a cookbook. It's a wellness guide on understanding what's, what is gluten, what is dairy, what role do certain vitamins and minerals play in the body, what damage does inflammation do to the body. So we have some of her cooking videos on there. So it's really helping people that are those professionals or parents that are having these struggles with their children, how they can have autonomy in the care of their child. What other services are out there? Who, you, who can you really be referred to if you're having these problems? And really trying to make the system of care more effect, effective and efficient across the board for people. No, that's great. Yeah, and I, yeah, keep keep up the great work with that because it's just, you Thank know, you. I've, I've picked up a few gems myself. So. <laughs> Um, so now a part of the show, I, I love to, to share with folks is really an advice, advice piece, right? And so, especially as we're, we're in, you know, this month for people who need support with either, you know, caring for a loved one with autism or ADHD, uh, what advice would you give them on where to start? I would say, uh, have a conversation with your primary care doctor, your pediatrician, make that your first go-to. But understand that there's like the CDC Milestones app, right? If you have younger children. The other thing I would say is access our website, access the YouTube channel that we have. We're on Instagram as well. And really understanding the full scope of what's affecting your child. 
we have some great on our website, we have great connections to other websites. We have connections to, and we've done videos around some of our favorite books. Some of my favorite books that I've read, especially on the topic of autism, um, there's two that really stand out for me, and it's called The Fabric of Autism by Judith Bluestone. She herself has Asperger's syndrome, and she talks about her journey and understanding how she came to have autism. And it's really around the idea of that epigenetics that we talked about earlier. But she really talks about her life as a practitioner and also working with others with autism that was completely transformational for how I viewed it as well. The second book that I really look to is uh, Patricia Lemer. Her last name is L-E-M-E-R. She has a book called Outsmarting Autism, and it's available on Amazon, too. I would have folks look at that kind of like a that's very technically heavy, too, but it's a really great book for professionals that want to learn more about the gut dysbiosis in these kids and something called total load theory and what is a biological dentist. And she talks a lot about developmental optometry. And really, the third one, I would say, is Sandy's book, That Desire to Be Well. And just understanding that role that, you know, when you're eating things that you're allergic, intolerant, or sensitive to, it causes inflammation. And inflammation in your body and your brain causes mental health symptoms. And so it, once you remove those things, at least for me, honestly, once I remove those things that were causing me inflammation, it was life changing for me. So those are some great resources, but it's, it's a matter of really informing holistic practice and holistic understanding of those resources. Oh, thank you for that. Um, uh, that's great information there. And for those who, um, you know, experiencing or caring, caring for those with, with autism, what are some challenges that people may not be aware of in, in order to care for those involved in, in, in this community? I think as soon as you said that, honestly, the one thing that I think of is when other family members or people in the public that just might have not constant contact with the family, but they like have check-ins or they see each other at events once in a while, they don't understand that it's a daily struggle sometimes for parents. And just to get your child to look at you or smile or say their first sound or their first word takes so much effort. Never, ever, ever minimize when a child makes progress because you have no idea how much work it has taken to be there and celebrate every moment. One of the things that I love just to kind of help create that that storyline for parents is I have them keep a journal every day just by their bedside. And so that they too can kind of have their own emotional support and check in to say that we are making such great progress. You know, we went from your child being able to say da da da. And now they're saying five words. And so it's looking at that gap versus gain mindset. It's like, how far do we have to come? How far do we have to go? But how far have we come? So really helping families celebrate those little milestones and understanding that it's not so simple for those families to just attend a wedding or attend a birthday party. There's so much planning of maybe, you know, social skills and social stories that they've had to plan out and having headphones ready for their child or preferred snacks or talking to the homeowner that they're going to ahead of time to have a quiet space for their child to go if they need to decompress, explaining to family members that it's not okay to just come up and talk to that kid and hug them. What is a soft, gentle approach to really gaining rapport with that child and how long that can sometimes take? So there's a lot of effort that goes into that. Don't ever undermine those little milestones. That's great advice. And, and now during this you know, Mental Health Awareness Month and eventually you know, BIPOC Mental Health Awareness Month, how can we help amplify the message about the resources available in this space? I would just say share as much as you can. Like, like our interview, the resources that other people in this same space are sharing. Understand and learn more about developmental optometry. There's a great website, covd.org. It's catorangevictordavid.org, covd.org understand the role that nutrition plays. A lot of my families, unfortunately, have been their own behavior detectives. So just making sure that you're looking at credible sources, whether you're getting it through PubMed or Healthline, 
making sure that it's been peer reviewed by somebody that has a credible background, getting some of the books that we talked about, and really investigating some of the non-mainstream approaches to, to dealing with behavioral issues. Because sometimes, again, it's so much more than meets the eye with behavior. There are just so many other questions. So taking advantage of those resources that we really talked about today, that would be a great place to start for people. Oh, that's great. Well, Kristen, look, I want to thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for <laughs> taking some time to speak with me today. I you know, I enjoyed learning about you and your company. And like I had mentioned earlier, you know, I definitely applaud uh, the work that you're doing. And I'm, I'm clearly, I'm a subscriber, right? So uh, look forward <laughs> you know, to, to following your work and would love for you to share where our listeners can support you. Sure. So the first one would be our website. It's www.behaviorworksofsouthwesternpa.com. We are also on Instagram at behaviorworkspa. And on YouTube, like you mentioned earlier, our channel is Beyond Behavior. Also, when you go to our website to subscribe to our newsletter, just so you can get information about when we do have chats like we're having now or more interviews with other dynamic professionals that we want to be able to share those out. Very good. Okay. So look, that'll do it for today's episode. Again, I want to thank you know, my guest, Kristen Weisdack, for joining us today. Uh, her information will be in the show notes as well as, you know, the books, some of the resources. I'm going to put together something and, and make sure that's available uh, for everyone. So I hope you all have a great week and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Kristen. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate the opportunity. The Great Resignation, people leaving their jobs in droves, there's a lot of buzz happening in the job market of late. Now did you or someone you know leave your job during the pandemic and want to share your story? We've been having some really good conversations in this space, so if you're interested, I'd love to have you join the program. If so, here's how you can do it. First. You can email us at hello at whyileft.co. That's hello at whyileft.co. Or visit us online at whyileft.co. That's whyileft.co. Look forward to having you join the conversation. Thanks again for listening to Why I Left. Be sure to join us next time for more stories from the Great Resignation. Visit us at www.yileft.co. That's yileft.co. And subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.